away. Welcome everybody, David Arnosti from the Capital Area Chapter of Michigan Interfaith Power and Lights, welcoming Rob Rafson here as he's going to present activities of chart house energy and some creative thinking about solutions for the future. Rob, yeah. free to screen share. Nice, uh, nice to meet everybody. Um, here you go. Um, I, Chart House Energy is a renewable energy development firm and we've been in business since 2009. Um, we've done uh, projects uh, across the state actually um, did the second largest in Illinois, the largest in Michigan, the largest in Iowa um, at the time, you know, at that time in 2008, 2009, um, solar was just sort of taking off. Um, and I decided that as part of what we were doing, we wanted to include an aspect of um, impacting the community, not just in the energy savings, but also in using uh, job training as a uh, mechanism to uh, create a, a entirely different uh, uh, or a, an additional benefit. Um, at, in 2008, um, President Obama sent a, uh, a letter out to all of the um, uh, sheriffs of all the jails in the country saying, you need to train for green jobs. Um, I, with another group of, of uh, five other people, worked with the Cook County Jail in Chicago to figure out um, what green jobs could be trained within the eight-week stay of an, the average eight-week stay of an inmate or detainee. And in that process, um, we developed, I developed a, um, a short training program, mostly to teach um inmates and detainees, uh, the idea or give them the opportunity to think about um, construction as, as a, a job post, uh, you know, once they leave the jail. And it was an eye-opening experience. I trained 48 inmates and detainees and, and as the tracking that they do, um, Quite a few of them did uh, go and get permanent jobs in construction. And since then, we have trained another 60 people in the last 12 years um, across different projects as we worked in different communities. In um, our project in Muskegon Heights, and this is part, partly I want to talk about not just what we did on this project, but both the benefits and challenges that um, places of faith have in trying to attract uh, money and the ability to get these projects done at, a, at an effective price. I think it's important that uh, this example where even us in a using a municipal project couldn't get financing to work for Muskegon Heights until we combined five different projects. This one here at DPW, this one at City Hall, which is uh, 150 KW, this one at the pumping station, one at the f main filtration plant, and one down at the, at the pumping station that takes the water out of the lake and pumps it up to the filtration plant. Combined, these five projects were a million and a half dollars. And that clears the financing fence that many of the um, um, national finance groups require. And so as you guys think about doing projects on yours, your facilities, you should think about how you can combine them with other facilities so that you can attract better, um, better contractors, better financing, and, a, and ultimately a better deal as you go forward. 
is also gives you the opportunity to um, require uh, local content and local construction. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the rules of the game here in Michigan right now in terms of how the economics work so that you guys can then understand better what these changing rules ha have in terms of what to expect once you put a solar array on your system. So you've got the solar panels, they produce power. You've got an inverter that converts it into regular AC power we use in the house or building or whatever. And then if you have extra power that you have generated through the solar panels, then it flows out through, out to the grid through the bi-directional meter. Um, in the past, inflow and outflow was the same. And so it was, it was called net metering and so it, it, nobody really noticed it was just what your annual average was is what you got, you know, what you said. Recently, they've changed the rules. And so your power rate is around, the general services rate is around 18 cents a kilowatt hour. At least that's in consumers territory. So that's um, a few penny, it's a part, yeah. Tenth of a penny or two tenths of a penny less in DTE, but their outflow rate is much lower also. So anyway, so you so if there's no sun out, like in the evening or whatever, you're buying power at 18 cents. Then the sun comes out and you're consuming it, consuming less and less power from the utility until the point where you suddenly make more power than than you're using. That outflows, but it only pays out at eight, at ten cents. Um, this is important because you're getting less. You know, even though it looks like you're consuming or your balance of inflow and outflow power are uh, can be the same. Sometimes you don't get as much benefit from the power you've generated, and. So in the example for um, our project in Muskegon Heights, the blue line is their power usage without solar. And then you have the solar decreasing the power rate. And then finally, you get to the point where, oh, you're, you're actually outflowing power in these periods um, um, when there's more sun than the energy they use. So this is, so during those periods, they would be selling that power at 10 cents. And during all of, the, all of these other periods, the difference between zero and the orange line is how much power they're still buying. So you will always have an electric bill from the power company and you will have an power produced in your own array. Is that clear thus far? So can we ask questions? Sure. Rob, um, so if we installed it prior to that change in the rate, are we grandfathered in or are we all affected by that lowering of the uh, oh, you're, reimbursement? You're grandfathered in for 10 years and then you will be, um, then you will be automatically transferred into the distributed generation rate. Okay. Thank and you. this outflow rate is a matter of continued con uh, um, uh, negotiation. So each year, they um, advocates like me that um, enter into the rate cases um, argue that that number should be like it is in uh, Minnesota it's a number that's about two cents higher than full retail rate because of all the benefits that it brings to both the grid and the utility. Um, of course, the utilities argue that they should only pay three cents a kilowatt hour. So there's this constant battle that goes forward um, throughout, uh, throughout the rate making process. So getting back to where I was. All right. So 
once you decide you want to you want a solar project, you sort of have three financing options. You've got a power purchase agreement where a financing group comes in and effectively they rent through your roof. You don't have to do anything. They just finance the project and you pay, you have no upfront cost, no maintenance. And all you do is you get a slightly lower rate. We've just signed up. Um, actually, the, the congregation needs to, to approve it, but the board has approved it for Good Shepherd um, uh, Church up in the UP. Um, and we expect that to happen soon. So is that, a, just, is that a Lutheran church? I believe so. I just was speaking with Rayford Ray, who's the head of the UP Episcopal Church, and he was getting heat. When are you putting up solar panels? So I'll tell them that the Lutherans are ahead. Yeah. So so anyway, so that's that's one option. And then there's two other options where you can either just basically borrow money. Or, or do an equipment lease where the finance company takes the tax benefits, lowers your rate, and then effectively um, it's a uh, lease to purchase. And at the end of 10 or five, 10 or 15 years, depending upon the deal, the, um, the house of worship um, owns the equipment. This is probably the best financing option. Um, there is a donation option where, or I should say just a straight purchase option where there's no financing, there's no cost. You just, you, you pay for the equipment. The problem is that you then lose all the tax benefits and therefore the return on investment is, is less. I'm worried about the return on investment because I want to make sure that when we do um, take money, whether it's borrowed, whether it's donated or otherwise, um, that you get the most benefit out of it. Um, other side benefits of things that you, you get, um, if the, the um, contractor does use uh, or does uh, bring in local um, employment. Uh, you can end up with some local job training. You can invigorate the community. You reduce the um, utility risk because the price of electricity keeps going up and you improve the environment, especially in low income communities where power plants were traditionally um, cited. So you end up as we close, like we're starting to close all the coal plants, those are almost exclusively in very poor communities. And therefore those, the environmental impacts put on those people who live near the plants uh, will be diminished as we go to more and more renewables. Um, now the challenges that you guys are gonna have is your projects are very small. They're hard to finance because there's, you know, unless the, the somebody in the um, organization is willing to um, monetize the tax benefits internally or finance it directly, um, it's really hard to make these deals work. We've worked very hard to put together a few people who are financing um, these projects and, ha and, and feel that it's important as an impact, as impact investors. Um, and then the other challenge is, you know, non nonprofit organizations can't monetize their tax benefits um, and some don't have a good credit history. So again, financing those organizations are, cha are challenging, especially in, in uh, poor communities. Uh, because tr really, honestly, you're building a piece of equipment that's going to last 25 to 40 years. And you really want to make sure that the uh, or faith-based organization is going to be around 
to realize all the value of the equipment installed. Um, it's also challenging because the, um, uh, the organizations really don't do this every day. So buying solar is maybe an unusual piece of equipment to purchase. Um, it takes a lot of people in these organizations to make decisions. So they take a long time to get to happen. And so from a, from a, a contractor's perspective, it's challenging for us to spend the time to um, develop these um, projects because of the amount of um, time and effort it takes to educate and to bring to um, fruition these projects. And that's about all I have to say. Thank you very much, Rob. First of all, I appreciate your clear presentation. Uh, the, uh, excellent highlighting of some of those issues. And uh, with five uh, local houses of worship that have just gone through the process of putting in solar projects within the last few years, I think we are ready to try to uh, address some of those barriers because I think every one of us has uh, encountered exactly the kind of barriers that you discussed for the smaller projects. Um, one point that you made that I thought was uh, particularly interesting regarding the training side of the project is um, you mentioned that a, at a certain size of project, then you can actually require local labor or incorporation of labor um, it, education of people. Um, do you have experience with like what kind of structures were in place so that for instance, your inmates were getting job training and uh, did you partner with community organizations? I'm not in that project, but um, we have partnered with a lot of uh, local community organizations and um, to hire um, local people at different projects. Um, and it's something that you can very easily ask as part of the um, acquisition process of a project. It's just to say part of you, uh, we require one or two people from the community to be you know, um, and, uh, um, uh, hired and trained during the installation of the project. It's every developer needs somebody just to carry panels and to move, you know, and to, um, and to start. But the key is that if you include um, OSHA fall safety, maybe OSHA electrical safety, then what happens is now somebody, even if they just worked a few days or a week on a project, now they have come out with a enough of an experience that they can say, I have worked for this contractor. And that becomes an, a, a huge driver for, um, uh, for to uh, impact that individual and their ability to then say, I have already worked for a contractor. I know that uh, some of the people in this group have been active in preparing for uh, resettlement of refugees who are coming to Lansing shortly. And I wonder if you've also had experience with non-English speakers who were integrated into construction work. Um, I would say non-first language, yes but not, um, not non-English speakers. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's just something that I'm not ready for because I don't speak another language. Right, right. Yeah. Do our attendees have other questions? I, I have a couple, Rob, if I could. Sure. The, the uh, 10 cent outflow, is that at all negotiable or is that set by the state? Now, what, what happens is each year, 
in in the rate case of the utility that you're with, they will ask the Public Service Commission for a rate, yep. and then the Public Service Commission will either accept it or they will say, no, you have to change the rate to something else. Yep. And uh, so that's, that's negotiated every year by the Public Service Commission. Yeah, okay. And for the uh, tax benefit, I have heard of uh, a couple of houses of worship that somehow were able to form LLCs, limited liability corporations, somehow associated with the uh, church or mosque. And uh, have you ever encountered that? Do you know, have you ever had experience with somehow uh, forming an LLC as a nonprofit? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. That's a that's not an or, or I should say a not for profit like a church. It's it's a for profit. Well, you create a for profit entity that then buys the project. It it creates a PPA with the uh, the host facility, and then after a period of time, either sells and I use that term euphemistically. Um, they abandon in place the, uh, the, the equipment that they've installed. Okay. And this is going to sound foolish, but that's legit. I mean, that, that's a... Uh... Oh, completely. Okay. Completely. Now, according to, to really be appropriately following the IRS rules, they should be selling it to the nonprofit at the fair market value. That is the, if you really want to follow the letter of the law, that's a requirement. Now, the reality is at the end of five years, the tax, the idea is that if it's sold at fair market value, then the LLC makes a profit on that sale and that the taxes that they will pay will then offset some of the future profits that the LLC would have made and the taxes that therefore would have been paid over time. So that's sort of a twist on the way the IRS gets their money in the end. I'd say a lot of people abandon that. Uh, like I said, they either sell or they just close the company and effectively abandon in place the equipment. I believe that the LLCs need to uh, hold the equipment at least for five years. Is it four years? Yep. At, at least for four years uh, before they switch modes, but they can keep it going for longer, just depending on what the, at the end of five or 10 years though, I'm sure that the depreciated value by any means is gonna be a fraction of what you started with. No, the depreciated right now, we're in 100% bonus depreciation. So at commissioning, it's fully depreciated. Oh, I see. So a depreciated value would be, after five years, a very small sum. No, zero. Oh, it would be zero. OK, zero is small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Excellent. in fact, at the, at the, the key is the reason they have to hold the asset for the four or five year period is what's called recapture. So if the asset changes hands during that first five, four years, then the IRS could ask for the depreciation and the portion, unused portion of the tax benefits taken. So here's an idea that um, you were discussing with me uh, earlier before your talk, that uh, supposing that we had a group of houses of worship with available roofs that were willing to uh, house uh, a solar project or projects uh, accrue the benefit of slightly lower uh, utility bills, but for the most part, continue paying what they've been generally paying, maybe preventing increases. And the, the difference could be used to invest in more community solar projects that might be specifically targeted at low income households, which otherwise wouldn't be able to get in there. Right. So 
the the idea that I've had and I want to um, that I'm in the process of fleshing out and creating a, a program. I'm so upset with the community solar programs that have been offered by the utilities and feel that they are really not serving anybody except for the utilities. Um, that the idea is to take, um, and the host facility would pay its full retail rate. And the margin difference between w w the cost of the project and related interest or profit that's required by the investors, all the remaining value would then be used to benefit the low income people in the community to, and to help take them out of energy poverty. And so my idea is that I have financing guys, impact investors that would like to see long-term um, positive impact on low-income people and like this idea, I'm looking for host facilities that are willing to contract for a 20 or 25 year period at full retail rate. So they wouldn't, it doesn't cost them anything. It doesn't benefit them at all. But the, the margin, once the equipment's paid off, all of that money that comes in will then be used to um, help um, low income people with their energy needs. So essentially, Ideally, one could view it as the recipient or the, the purchaser of the power would be buying its power from a special utility, which was a plan, uh, a, a, a B type corporation, a benefits corporation, with the idea that all of the value would be invested in energy justice or energy poverty ameliorating kind of projects which yes. could be uh, house-based solar. So last Saturday, I was speaking with a woman who works for Lansing Housing Commission. Uh, Lansing Housing Commission has uh, four or five apartment complexes around Lansing, Schedule 8 housing. And I said, Christine, what if we had a project where we put solar panels on the roof and uh, drive down the cost of utilities for the low income people who are renting those apartments. And she said, we're just renovating. Talk to my colleague who is in renovations. We've got the roof. So this would be uh, presumably a long term um, a building, even though the beneficiaries may come and go depending on who's renting. But that would be another way to structure it so that there would be um, immediate value for uh, low-income families. Yes, and that ultimately that you, your my goal would be to take the profit from the host facilities that 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 are going to be around for the twenty-five years and be you know capable and able to pay that amount. Take that money and then buy at no cost for apartment, low end uh, affordable housing units. And um, I, an example, um, when Habitat for Humanities a few years ago, they were um, putting new roofs on 40 homes and 13 of those homes had good solar potential. And we put together, I put together the financing, the people and everything. And shortly before we were ready to sign the deal, the person I was with was no longer with Habitat and the whole project fell apart. But, oh, but conceptually, that's exactly what I wanna do is mm -hmm. I wanna create the funds that then can fund those projects because ideally you want to put solar on a building at the time that you're putting a new roof on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, the Southside Community Coalition is working with uh, developers who are uh, who own the old school across the street on Holmes, 
which they would like to be replaced with a community medical center so that people have uh, walkable uh, instant care mm -hmm. in South Lansing. Now, um, they're interested in, could that building be LEED certified and so forth? And if a solar project were part of that, that definitely would be a installation that would be around 30 or 40 years. It would be right. a new, new roof. Yeah. So the two parts is you need to have the, the, the host facility to create the, the income stream that can then fund the other projects that will be then fund, funding the, um, the, you know, the recipient mm -hmm. group. And I think your point is that the income stream is coming from an investment in clean energy rather than uh, just a donation, which is sort of a one-time only thing, but rather um, come up with a pipeline so that uh, the investments are generating more investments right. In, green, right. in clean energy. Right, and that some, will, some of those will be additional projects that then will be able to fund more projects, but some of those projects will not have resulting income, but will end up with long-term positive impacts on those people that are, that are living in those facilities, those affordable housing units, whether they're single family or multifamily. As well as showing a path for how can institutions move into a carbon-free future where we're using renewable energy to power our facilities, to light our places of worship and things like that, which is definitely a desirable goal, but uh, not something that is easily negotiated right now. So I, I do think that that would be a, that would be a deliverable and a, a desirable outcome in any event. Just imagine a future where you're, your congregation, your house of worship is not addicted to fossil fuel. Well, that sounds pretty good. If you've been to COP26 or read the news or were in Michigan in June or in August when we had those huge downpours and people were talking about climate changes now. Um, so I, I do see that those pieces really um, when put together in the right way, it wouldn't necessarily fit in with the master plan for our state or statewide utilities. Right, right. Which is, which is, you know, their attitude is that they want to retain their monopoly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think the key for me is that in general, there's been very little done um, both politically or by the utilities to help um, or to improve or correct um, environmental and um, uh, energy poverty, uh, environmental justice and, 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 and to correct energy poverty, which is just so you know, it's if you are paying more than 6% of your income um, for energy. And that's what the definition of uh, energy poverty is. In low income communities, do you know what the numbers really are? I, I know from uh, stories in Detroit where people's utility was were being cut off, <laughs> that it was eat or pay the rent right. or pay the utility. I actually right don't know what the numbers are for yeah. In in low income communities in the state, it, it's something like twenty six percent of all people in the state are in energy poverty, and in the low income communities, it's approach it's forty five to fifty percent of people in those communities are in energy poverty, mm -hmm. and um, and then like DTE comes up with an idea, oh we should just have um, those people prepay so that we don't have to be running around to, to collect money from people who can't afford. This mm -hmm. is their solution. 
Rob, do you have any knowledge of whether the infrastructure bill that's just been passed has provisions that would positively impact your plans or related plans? I completely do not know. <laughs> that is something I need to look into. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, it's so new. I, it'll be interesting to see how it gets administered. Are the Opportunity Green Impact investors um, private capital that um, is like social investors or where, where are they from? Where do they get their funds? Um, the ones that I know are people who are very, very, very wealthy, have retired, and now want to do something good with their money. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, they come from financing, from um, attorneys, all sorts of different businesses, and that that's, that's what they've done to succeed. And, and now they want to make something, um, you know, make a social impact. Mm -hmm. with their time and money. A Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association web, webinar recently had a discussion of a community group in Cameron Davis neighborhood of Detroit, which uh, is a lower income neighborhood in their project, which was very much grassroots, focused on uh, bringing solar power to 25 different households. Mm -hmm. uh, a standard three kilowatt uh, installation, but different kinds of houses. And that's an example of very much ground up. Like they, they didn't have, they were not part of a national organization or I'm actually not sure where they got all their financing, but is it your impression that a million dollars is what attracts the attention in terms of this is a big enough project where we can actually move the needle for those, for those investor pools? For those investor pools, um, it clears the fence to be able to mm -hmm. for them to invest. These are the big national guys that that uh, invest in these projects. Mm -hmm. I think you can get some of the impact investors into the into the hundreds of thousands range, but mm -hmm. it's really even then it's challenging. Mm -hmm. So that when you look at each of your house of worship. And you say it's a project that's less than a hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to attract them. But if we can combine a group of investments, mm -hmm. then it's possible. Mm -hmm. Well, a million dollars would be three or four hundred kilowatts, and that's like uh, twenty churches. We've already done five churches and uh, one Islamic center, so we're. Uh, in a piecemeal, piecemeal approach, we've done about a quarter of that. But I think that you can definitely wrap your head around uh, that. Could, could we potentially get 20 other partners in this? I think we could. They're, um, in many cases, just waiting to be asked. Yeah. And um, EV yeah. Watts, the um, online application to look at roofs and think about solar potential shows a lot in the Lansing area. Oh yeah, you mean solar roofs? Yes. The, the, yeah, yeah the, this is a pretty cool thing that Google did. Any other questions? I think Doug is trying to say something, but you're muted. You have to turn your mute button off. Doug, you're still muted. There you go. Got it. Now, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Using uh, Dave's analogy of those five apartment buildings and they're renovating. So if they're renovating, and I'm assuming they're putting in new furnaces and maybe hot water heaters and that type of thing. So what is the difference in the price uh, since they would no longer need necessarily a lot of that um, let's say fossil fuel type furnaces, what would be the cost of, would there be a savings or would it break even or would it still cost more to install the solar energy? Um, good question. I think it's a balance. 
a lot of uh, facilities are now shifting from, like you said, from fossil fuel heaters to heat pumps, which is electrically driven, lower energy, but more electricity. So you, in that case, you'd end up with more, uh, a larger solar array. If you are just going and upgrading to a better um, natural gas system, then, and you put in LED lights and you do the other things that will decrease energy, then the project will get smaller. Okay. And, and I wonder too, if you've looked at um, adding wind power to any of those particular projects to enhance the um, electric pull? Um, I have looked at um, wind, but uh, the problem is that urban wind, well, two things. One, small wind is, there's very poor return on investment. Mm -hmm. And worse, urban wind is even worse because um, buildings and trees disrupt the wind flow patterns and you end up with very poor wind quality. Even though you at times can have very strong winds, the key is that you're really looking for stable day in day out winds. And okay. that, high, that happens at very, very high elevations. That's why the really big wind turbines by the shore or out in the lake is ideal. Okay, thank you. So the, the current biggies I've been reading, uh, GE and other manufacturers are making 15, even 20 megawatt um, uh, wind turbines of like football size per vein. Uh, these are, there's a huge scale, um, economy of scale for wind. And for solar, not so much, because if you have distributed solar, you're gonna be using it right where it's produced. So you have less line loss. It's about the same sunny, same, about the same amount of sun in different parts of say uh, Lansing area. You don't have this big difference between elevation. And the huge solar farms, which are cheaper to build per watt, do take up a lot of like farmland or other areas which could be used for something else. If you're putting it on a roof, You've already built that, so you haven't um, turned cropland into industrial electricity. And I think that that's something that has not been emphasized. The, the other thing that I think is important in considering projects going forward is that uh, these smaller scale community-based kind of projects can build a constituency. And I think we need more strong voices so that say at the Michigan level, our state laws change to enable, for instance, uh, effective large scale wind installations. And right now there's just a lot of inertia and people dragging their, feel, their, their, their feet. And we hear from, um, like the youngest generation that this is their future at stake. And, I think foot dragging is just not an acceptable option right now. So that's, that's why I appreciate creative solution uh, finders like Rob Rafson, who can challenge us to do something different and better uh, in thinking outside the lines. Yes, thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I would like to Thank our speaker very much for coming on. Use the little emoji if you'd like, if you're, if you're into emojis. And, uh, Thank you. Looking forward to more discussions. Our group looks forward to having uh, some sort of get together in January where we do brainstorming and look forward in the new year. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Enjoy Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Dave.